Lily's father had some pretty crazy connections. He's actually the reason I'm writing this. My dad's friend had connections. Whenever my family ran into the slightest inconvenience, it was solved hours later. My mother was fired from her job and was promoted to a higher position hours later. Grandpa had terminal cancer and was miraculously cured. I realized my family had their own personal fairy godmother. All Dad had to do was ring Mike, who pulled strings that I never saw. I used to joke that if Mike ever died, his funeral would be attended by a mysterious man standing under a black umbrella. Dad said it was never that serious, but over the years I noticed Mike fixed all their problems. My brother got into his dream college without even trying. He didn't even graduate high school and somehow got into Harvard with Mike's connections. So, I chose not to even try in my first year of college, moving back home and getting a job in the mall. I wanted to be a photographer, not a doctor, which was what my father insisted on. Mike did get me into a prestigious medical school, but I was scared of blood. I did tell him multiple times I wouldn't be able to stomach it. Dad was pissed, sure, but he didn't say anything, allowing me to stay for the summer so I could sort my thoughts out. He told me Mike would easily be able to get me into another school abroad, but I told him over and over again. I didn't want to be a doctor. That was Dad's dream, not mine. I did ask if he could get his connections to find me a summer job in photography, but Dad was adamant that both of his children were going to medical school. Which sucked. I understood Dad wanted us to be successful, but I hated blood. The idea of slicing into a human body made me nauseous. I mean, come on, I couldn't even deal with movie horror. My brother was training to be a surgeon. Somehow. Which was weird, when, just a year prior, he had attempted to leave home with his girlfriend to pursue his passion. I hadn't spoken to him in a while, but Dex had suddenly dropped his love for acting and dumped his girlfriend. He and Elena were engaged, and he just left her like that. Like he never even loved her. I still remember the night before he ran away. Dex told me to do the same. There's something wrong with Mike, my brother told me, sitting on my bed. Dex had been suspicious of Mike since we were kids and our father's friend had stopped us getting sick. We had the stomach flu once during middle school and had not been sick since. Which was crazy, right? Mom didn't seem to be phased, and Dad insisted we just had really good immune systems. Dex was convinced it was witchcraft. I was skeptical, more on the Mike has connection side. Now, my brother was a completely different fucking person. I knew siblings grow apart when they leave for college, but this was a whole other level. Dex never answered my texts or calls, and when he did, he was either studying in night classes or with his smart-ass friends. Growing up was a given, I knew that. But Dex became a stranger I couldn't stand. He was a whole other boy who happened to wear my brother's face. Dex was too different at Thanksgiving dinner, too formal, like he'd been possessed by a royal, talking in depth about his classes and that he was the top-ranked student. That wasn't Dex. I knew it wasn't my brother because Dex hated being categorized. He also hated Harvard. Dream school my ass. He could barely focus in school, his teachers insisting on him being screened for ADHD, which Dad refused. Because, in Dad's eyes, we had to be perfect. I jokingly commented that Dex didn't even graduate high school just to shut him up, and Dad almost choked on a mouthful of turkey. Mom pursed her lips around the rim of her wine glass. Dex hadn't spoken to me since, completely under our father's spell. When we were kids, my brother left me little notes to reassure me that I was going to be okay. He'd hide them in sofa creases and slip them under my door. Except when I searched his room, there was nothing, only the ghost of who Dex used to be. His application for a drama school in New York was still on his dresser, crumpled under old movie posters and textbooks, covered in coffee stains. He'd only written his name. I laughed at that. That was Dexter. Distracted by everything. It was 2 a.m. when Dad pulled me out of bed. Ah, uh, wiping sleep from my eyes, I blinked at him, confused. Get in the car, Dad told me. We're going out. I didn't like the idea of going out at 2 a.m., but sure, 
a father-daughter car ride sounded fun. Sliding onto cool leather seats, hesitantly, I was still wrapped in my blanket, still sleepy, my head pressed against the car window. It was freezing cold, I was shivering. While I was a little more awake, my mind drifting into fruition, a father-daughter car ride was sounding progressively less appealing. I noticed Dad was driving us out of town, which was out of character. Dad hated going out of town. I couldn't help it, a shiver of panic slipping down my spine. I could feel my heart start to skip in my chest, my stomach twisting into uncomfortable knots. Where are we going? He didn't reply, cranking the radio up, which left me to stew in the silence and the sound of my heart pounding faster. Pressing my face against the glass, I blinked at the long, winding road, blanketed oblivion in front of me. We were in the middle of rural Virginia, and my phone was dead, so I couldn't even text Mom. I did have several locations in my head, though neither of them justified 2 a.m. Couldn't Dad have waited until morning? The thought suddenly struck me. Was Grandpa sick? The more I thought about it, the sicker I started to feel. I hated the dark, and it was the kind of dark that felt almost empty, hollow, like there was no ending and the road would continue forever. The dark has always felt suffocating to me, and being enveloped in pitch black open oblivion, I had a sudden, overwhelming urge to jump out of the car. There were no street lights, and the further away we were driving from home, from safety, panic was starting to choke my throat. I couldn't breathe, suddenly, clasping my hands in my lap. Dad, I said, my voice a sharp whisper I couldn't help. Where are you taking me? When Dad didn't answer, only stepping on the gas, I kicked his seat. Dad. Dad's fingers tightened around the wheel. Shopping was his only response. Shopping? My mind whirred with questions. At 2 a.m.? When I leaned back in my seat, my hands delving between the gaps by habit, I pulled out a folded piece of card. I thought it was trash, but peering at it, something was written in black ink. When a street light finally appeared, a sickly glow illuminating the note, I found myself staring at a single word written in my brother's old writing. Dex's handwriting had drastically changed. For example, on my recent birthday card, he signed his name in perfect calligraphy. But I knew his old writing, his scrappy scribbles that were hard to read, which was exactly what I was staring at, and it was unmistakable, something I couldn't ignore, even when I tried to push down that panic, that drowning feeling starting to envelop me. Run. My gaze flicked to the front. Luckily, Dad wasn't paying attention. Shopping? I said shakily, my aunt pawing for the lock on the door. My breaths were heavy, suddenly, suffocated in my chest. I couldn't trust them. I maintained a smile, but I felt like I was fucking drowning, Dex's note grasped in my fist. Sliding across the seat, I tried the other door. Also locked. Mmm, shopping, Dad hummed. We're out of milk. But there are no stores open. I managed to choke out. I was all too aware of the car slowing down, and I was already planning my escape. My mind felt choked and wrong, and there were so many questions. If Dex had been on this exact car ride, then what happened to him? Mike was my top suspect. If Dad's friend with connections could turn my brother into a stranger, then he could do anything to me. Weighing my options, I feverishly watched my father find a parking spot. I had to think straight. If I didn't, I was going to end up like Dex. I had a plan, sort of. If I dove over the front seat when my father wasn't looking, I would be able to get away. I had no plan for after that. I was just focusing on getting out of the car. However, while I was ready to leap over the seat, Dad stopped the car and jumped out. I tried to shuffle back, tried to inch toward the left door, but Dad was already grasping my arm and pulling me out of the car. In my panic, I dropped the note, stumbling out into cool air that grazed my cheeks. The night should have felt like any other, and yet I was standing in the middle of nowhere. The sky above was too dark, no stars. I was going to run, before I saw what was in front of me, a towering building. The place reminded me of a warehouse, or even a facility, a silver monolith cut off from the rest of the world. There was a lake nearby, and nothing else. Dad grabbed my hand gently, though his grasp was firm, a subtle order to stay by his side. 
He flashed his ID card at a guard, pulling me towards automatic doors lit up in eerie white light. My panic twisted into confusion, relief washing over me like warm water. Dad was right. It was a shopping center. When we entered, and I found myself mesmerized by a labyrinth of aisles, we passed a section of canned food and then snacks and medical supplies. Studying each aisle, I was in awe. Survival equipment, diapers, and a whole aisle dedicated to college textbooks. What was this place? It was like a super Costco. When I reached for a cart, Dad kept pulling me further down each aisle, and the deeper I was dragged into this place, what was being sold started to contort in my vision, like I was in a nightmare. The lights above started to dim, the goods being sold twisting into things I didn't want to see. Stomach lining in vacuum packaging, and then a raccoon skeleton. I was comforted by a section of whipping cream and baking soda, before we turned a corner, a sudden blur of twisted red slamming into me. It was all I could see, stretched straight down the aisle. I thought it was fish at first, fresh fish being sold early. Except each bulging mass of red my father and I passed was unmistakably human. Dad, I rasped, glimpsing a human heart sitting on display, encased in ice. What is this place? I started to back away, but I couldn't stop staring. I found myself in a trance, following my father. It was like stepping into an emergency ward. I had been there once, and never again. I hated blood, and it was everywhere, smearing the floor and shelves. I don't know if I was in shock, before reality started to hit me in what felt like electroshocks. There were body parts for sale, both dead and alive, human brains both separate, and being sold with their bodies. People. Normal people put on display, their skin marked with red pen highlighting their parts. I stopped walking, coming to a halt, my body wouldn't move. I couldn't fucking breathe. Lily. Dad pulled me in front of one sign in particular. Intelligence. 17 to 25. I saw others. The advertisement showed a group of smiling teenagers, mid-laugh. I should have been glued to it, trying to figure out what intelligence meant, except my gaze wasn't on the sign, or even my father, already forking out cash. I was dizzily aware I was taking steps back, but I couldn't bring myself to move, to twist around and run. We were too deep into the store, and the exit was so far away, a labyrinth I knew wouldn't be able to get through without dropping. The store owner greeted my father, and I had to breathe deeply to stay afloat. My legs gave way, but I wouldn't allow myself to fall. Not in this place. Fuck. My head was spinning, everywhere I looked there were either body parts, or people with those body parts on display. Dad introduced himself as a friend of Mike, though his voice didn't feel real, drifting in and out of reality. Fuck. The display said intelligence, but intelligence didn't make sense. There was a guy standing in front of me, blondish brown hair, his pupils wide and dilated. Dressed in a simple white shirt and shorts, he looked almost high, and yet despite that, I noticed he was trembling, his hands pinned behind his back. He stood perfectly straight, his chin up, eyes forward, like a puppet on strings. It wasn't until my eyes found his forehead, where his IQ had been written in permanent marker, when I realized what the store was advertising. What my father had brought me to. I half wondered if this boy had the same feverish urge like me. Run. Ben is our smartest. He was donated a few weeks ago. Apparently, he tried to kill himself. Who would have thought, right? A smart kid like that trying to end it. Anyway, he's been fully checked. The kid graduated early and attended Cambridge University in England, only to move back home and attempt suicide on Christmas Eve. The stall owner's voice slammed into me like waves of ice water, and I remembered Dex's sudden change in personality. I let out a sob I couldn't control, my nerve endings on fire. I wanted to kill my dad, right there, barely conscious and trapped. I wanted to wrap my hands around my father's neck and squeeze until he was blue, until his eyes were rolling into the back of his head. Still, fuck, I couldn't take my eyes off of the intelligence being paraded in front of me. This 19-year-old boy with a crooked smile, freckles speckling his cheeks. This kid, who had a life, a family, and friends, and a reason why he chose to die. Reduced to an empty shell with a high IQ. 
The owner gestured to the kid, who didn't even blink, didn't dare make eye contact with me. No, I said, and then I said it louder, twisting around. I needed to get away. I needed to run. There were three guards in front of me. Following the store owner's order to restrain me, they did, hesitant when my father barked at them not to hurt me. I can assure you, your daughter will have a sparkling career. The stall owner was smiling widely, and I screamed, struggling violently. I'll take him, Dad said, unfazed by my cries. How much is he? Nine fifty, the man said. My wife has done business with you before, so consider it a discount, he turned to the boy with a laugh. Ben is a good boy, so it'll take around three hours. Usually, upon removal, the brain goes into shock and can sometimes shut itself down due to trauma. It can take weeks, even months for it to settle inside its new body. His smile widened, and I ate up my meager dinner, spewing all over the guard. When I screamed, my cries were muffled, suffocated, I felt like I was choking. I was going to fucking die. I have to get out of here. My thoughts were paralyzed, fight or flight sending my body into a manic frenzy. I wanted to find comfort in the boy on sale. But he kept smiling, wider and wider. The owner ignored my freak out, my violence struggled to survive, to claw my way out of that place. It was dark outside, and we were so far away from home, but the darkness felt safe, while light was threatening to plunge me deeper and deeper. The store owner was still speaking, and I took the opportunity to head by a guard. He let go instantly, and I dropped to my knees. I was free. But I didn't know where to go. Everything was blurry, twisted and contorted red. When I was yanked to my feet again, I felt numb. However, the owner rolled his eyes at me, like I said, Ben wanted to die, he chuckled. I'm positive he won't fight back, and if he does, you're free to return him within 30 days, like all of our products. Oh. Also, do not worry. The mind had been wiped of personality. The only thing remaining is the IQ of the boy and his achievements. We removed the core person shortly after buying from our distributor to avoid, let's call them complications. Dad nodded slowly. Then I'll take him. I stopped breathing, my body going still. Was this really happening? Was I going to die? Dad, I whispered when my father cut my cheeks and told me to be brave. I did try. I fucking tried to nod, like I was accepting it, before clawing his eyes out. I tried to use soothing tones, but they weren't working. I resorted to screaming at him. I told him he was dead to me, that he was a psychopath. I really thought it might wake him up, make him realize that I was his daughter. I wasn't a caricature of what a successful daughter should be. I was his fucking daughter. Dad. Except he didn't listen, his hands tightening on my shoulders. You want to be smarter, don't you, Lily? No, an animalistic shriek ripped from my throat. I tried to attack him, screeching like a wild animal. I did try to run, biting down on a guard's hand. But it was my father who pulled me back, which brought reality crashing down. I was going to die. I stopped trying to get away, stopped crying, while I was picked up and taken through a door splattered with scarlet. I remember being pinned down on an ice-cold surface, a cruel prick in my neck numbing my limbs, and silver blades whirring above me. My arms and legs were restrained, my forehead marked with a cold red pen that tickled. I laughed, but my laughter exploded into sobs. Figures in blue scrubs surrounded me in a blur. I slept for a while, dazed from the drugs. The sound of a saw startled my numb thoughts, and I twisted my head, eyes flickering, lips trying to form words. I remember everything was slow. Like I had been forced into slow motion. The back of my head had been shaved, and all of my hair was gone. The freezing surface of the surgical table made me shiver. When the sound of the saw became unbearable, I gave up and forced myself to peer through a curtain of plastic. There was a bed next to mine, pooling red seeping across the floor, a limp arm hanging over the edge. The hand was still moving, still clenching into a fist, like they could feel it, every cruel slice ripping them apart. I wondered who the boy was. What his life was like, and why he chose to end it. 
I squeezed my eyes shut when the salt continued, blood beginning to run, almost black across pristine white tiles. When I opened them, the bed was being wheeled away. And it was my turn. Footsteps came thudding towards me, the screeching sound of a saw coming to life. They didn't give me a countdown or tell me everything was going to be okay. I saw a bright light, so close I really thought I could reach it. I did, half wondering if it was my dad coming to rescue me. Maybe he changed his mind after all. But Lily didn't wake up. I did. I woke with a forced smile and a body that felt comfortably mine. I took my new father's hand, the bandages around Lily's head itchy. When my father took me home, I waited until night. Then I went into the kitchen and chose the sharpest knife I could find, butchering the bastard when he was curled up in bed. He should have been awake, just like you were, Lily. He should have been able to feel it. I'm glad Mom was out, because then I'd have to kill her too. I'm sorry I took your body, Lily. And for the record, I didn't want to die. I was kidnapped and sold overseas by my psychotic university professor. I didn't jump off of a fucking bridge on Christmas Eve. That's the story he tells to all of his customers. So they feel better about murdering us. I still have a family out there, waiting for me to come home. And I'm going to find them. Fuck. I'm sorry I took your body, Lily. I'm sorry your dad is a piece of shit. And I'm sorry I burned your house to the ground. I'm terrified of what Dad did to Lily's brother. But I'm so grateful for her memories still clinging to this body. She didn't answer me until a few days ago. Her voice is soothing, still haunting the back of my mind. It's okay, Lily is happy I killed her father. But she still wants to know what happened to her, or I guess, our brother. I live alone in Alaska. The twisted man has been peeking in through my windows. A few years ago, I decided I needed a major life change. Everything seemed to be going downhill my finances, my mental health, my life. I would go weeks without sleeping sometimes as the heavy traffic passed through the city streets down below. Every time I went outside, I saw more homeless people, more needles and crack pipes littering the ground, more muggings and assaults and overdoses and deaths. The city had become a wasteland and I knew it was time to leave. I had no girlfriend, no wife, no kids. My parents had both died a few years prior and I barely talked to my siblings anymore. I had nothing to tie me down to this place where I felt like I was dying inside a little more each day. That was why I sold nearly everything I owned, got in my car and drove up to Alaska to try starting anew. I bought a small cabin and a plot of land in the middle of its majestic mountains and dark, enchanting forests. In the winter, the northern lights would shine through like the eyes of God, sending out divine trails of light that danced through the sky in cosmic waves. And while the move did help give me some peace of mind, in the end, the source of all my problems had ultimately followed me thousands of miles into this endless wilderness. It would take me a long time to realize the cause of all this misery was myself. Because, as a wise man once said, wherever I go, there I am. I lived in that cabin for three months without any major issues other than the constant threat of bears, moose, and wolves. I had a rifle and a shotgun for hunting, a small garden in the backyard, and a solar panel to generate electricity. This is the life, I said, relaxing on a hammock I had strung across the corner of the cabin while staring at the endless beauty directly outside the window. White cap mountains loomed like giants in front of thick clusters of evergreens. A virgin covering of fluffy snow made the entire world glisten and sparkle. There wasn't a house or road in sight. No work, no stress, no pollution, no cars honking all the time. I closed my eyes, breathing in the clean air. I ended up falling asleep for a couple hours, waking up just as the sun had started setting. Bright orange streaks mixed with the bloody smears of the fading light as it disappeared behind the mountains. I groggily arose, stumbling over to make a cup of instant coffee. As I sipped it, I wandered around the room, looking for something to pass the time. There were still quite a few random objects left behind by the last owner that I hadn't gotten rid of yet. I had moved in to find a stocked bookshelf filled with classics by Philip K., Dick, Isaac Asimov, and Robert Heinlein. Bored, I started rifling through the collection, looking for something good to pass the time. 
as I shuffled past a maze of death and ubic, something caught my eye. A black, leather-bound book with no title or author name stood there, its cover faded with time and wear. Curious, I pulled it out and opened it. I saw the cursive scrawled across the pages in a neat, copperplate script and realized it was a diary left behind by the previous owner. The first entry was dated January 9, 2015. This is what it said. I don't know if I'm going crazy or not. I went into town to talk to my therapist yesterday and she said I should try writing everything down. She talks to me like it's all in my head. But I know it's not. When I first moved into the cabin, it seemed like paradise. I never thought in a million years that something would be slinking around at night. I never thought it would be hiding under my bed, peeking in windows and following me like a shadow. Right now, I'm snowed in with a cup of coffee in one hand and my pistol in the other. I can't sleep anymore. I keep hearing something shuffling around under the bed. Sometimes, I think I even hear ragged breathing, as if a corpse with dirt in its lungs had come back to life. I've caught glimpses of that thing in the darkness. Whatever it is, its skin is loose, almost falling off the bone. It almost looks like a naked, emaciated man. Its eyes are rotted and dark, its back hunched, its spine twisted and jutting out like tumors. It moves in this slow, jerky way, but I can never seem to catch it. Its body seems broken and out of alignment. Its legs bend the wrong way sometimes. By the time I turn on the lights or try to take a video of it, it's always disappeared. But its fetid odor remains. It lingers in the cabin like a sweet-smelling, spreading infection. I don't know what it wants from me. I want to leave, but with the storm raging outside, I'm stuck here, unable to get all the way back to town. The snow surrounds the cabin in mounds five feet high. I feel like a prisoner caged with a rabid beast, not knowing when it will strike. My wife claims she hasn't seen or heard anything, but she keeps vanishing on me. Last night, she disappeared in the middle of a snowstorm. Where did she go? I asked her in the morning, but she said she was here the whole time. She didn't remember anything. There's no way she went into town. There wasn't time and the trails were impassable that far down. Something's going on here but I don't know what it is. I'm truly scared for our lives. I slammed the diary shut, not wanting to read anymore. I didn't want to become infected by some kind of contagious cabin fever. If the last owner had gone insane in the mountains and started hallucinating naked corpses crawling around, I really didn't want to know. I shoved the diary back in the bookshelf, going for a maze of death instead. I tried to forget what I had read in the diary as I flew through the novella. All night, I tried to get the image of the naked, twisting man with rotted eyes out of my head, but I couldn't. I eventually fell asleep right before dawn. But, as my eyes were closing, I thought I saw a silhouette in the window of a starved man with excited, black eyes that seemed to be running out of his skull. I thought I saw him put his inhumanly long fingers against the glass as he leaned forward. I blinked, sitting up and glancing out into the white, snow-covered wonderland. There was nothing there. Another hunter occasionally followed the deer trails near my cabin. A frozen lake stood a quarter mile away, the surface white and covered in thick drifts of snow. I bundled up, deciding to go outside for a hike in the frigid dawn. I strapped on my snowshoes and grabbed my shotgun, as I always did when I went outside. I never knew what a polar bear might be waiting around the next tree, after all. I opened the door, seeing footprints pressed into the snow all around my house. At first, I thought it was that silhouette I had seen, the nightmarish thing from the diary. But the footprints didn't go over to my window. They followed the trail twenty feet away, veering off towards the frozen lake at the bottom of the hill. I glanced down in that direction, seeing a black figure plodding slowly forward. Steve! I cried, recognizing my only neighbor in a four-mile radius. He had a cabin about a mile away on his own little plot of land. He jumped, clearly startled by the sudden noise. His black snow pants and heavy fur coat swished together as he spun, raising his rifle high. When he saw me, he immediately lowered it and put a gloved hand up in a friendly greeting. Hey Josh. Surprised to see you up this early, he yelled over the muted wintry landscape. Sounds always seemed different after it snowed, 
as if all the noise in the world had become faded and dead. Yeah, I've been having a little trouble sleeping, I said, slinging my shotgun around my shoulder. What are you doing anyway? Just a little hunting, you know, he said, giving me a sly wink. Animals are always most active around dusk and dawn, it seems. That's why I always have the best luck, anyway. He stepped close to me, staring me in the eyes. You do look like shit. Those bags under your eyes are big enough to carry groceries in. Yeah, trust me, I know. Hey, this might sound a little weird, but did you know the previous owner of this cabin? I asked. Steve's wrinkled, old face fell into a scowl. His expression immediately became guarded and distant. Sure, sure, we met, he exclaimed bluntly. He seemed to be searching my face for something, but I didn't know what. His reaction left me feeling off-balance and nervous. Is he still around? I said. Steve's scowl deepened. Buddy, I don't know what this is about, but he's dead. He's been dead. He died in that cabin, actually. He pointed a finger at my home accusingly. With those words, my heart seemed to drop into my stomach. Waves of dread flowed through my body like water. How? How did he die? Like a heart attack or something? I asked. Steve's gaze turned downwards. He didn't meet my eyes. Do you know that Alaska has the highest missing persons rate in the entire United States? It's not even close. In fact, for the population size, we have far more people who go missing and never get found than anywhere else. They even have a name for it, the Alaska Triangle, Steve said. And we're square in the middle of it. I stared blankly at him, wondering where he was going with this. It seemed like a way to avoid answering my question. No, I didn't know that, I responded. Steve nodded, raising his head again. He heaved a deep sigh. Look, the thing with the last owner and his wife, it's somewhat disturbing. If you really want to know, I'll tell you, but it's certainly not going to help your peace of mind. And it definitely isn't going to help you get some sleep. I want to know, I insisted instantly. The wind started to whip past us. Flakes of ice and snow flew sideways in the sudden currents. Let's go back to your cabin then, Steve said, pulling his heavy fur lined head off and shaking out his long, black hair behind him. I could use a bit of whiskey to warm up. We sat down with a bottle of Johnny Walker and two shot glasses. I wasn't much of a drinker, but Steve certainly was. He chugged three shots in the span of a minute. I sipped at mine, drinking half and putting it back down on the coffee table with a thunk. Steve grunted, hissing through his open mouth for a moment. Ah, oh, that's the good stuff, he said, slamming his chest as the burning liquor worked its way down. Steve looked up at me with a new sparkle in his eyes. Ah, uh, so you want to know about what happened to a Lenning? Well, I'll tell you that no one really knows the whole story. I used to see him occasionally, come down and have a drink and talk. We all know each other around here, obviously. I nodded, motioning him on. He seemed like a normal, upstanding guy. He kinda reminded me of you, actually. A young guy trying to escape the hustle and bustle of the city life, the cancer of the American dream. Well, he was here for maybe a couple months, I don't know. Everything seemed fine. We used to go skeet shooting occasionally, have a beer, you know. We get together with a couple other hunters who live closer to town and sometimes play some poker. I never saw anything odd about Will. I never could have predicted what happened to him. He heaved a long sigh at this, looking out the window at the sharp mountains with an expression of nostalgia. Well, what happened to him? I asked, encouraging him to go on. He started talking about seeing someone peering in through his window at night. He talked about hearing sounds from under his bed while he was laying there in the dark sounds like diseased breathing and shuffling. He started keeping all the lights on in his cabin 24 hours a day. Steve leaned close to me. A glimmer of fear rippled across his pale, wrinkled face. He started to lose his mind. Started digging holes all over the place, looking for something. Even in the middle of snowstorms, I would occasionally see him outside, digging. It seemed like he never slept anymore. 
It was classic cabin fever if I ever saw it. It was only a few weeks later that I came over here, concerned. I hadn't heard from him in a few days, which was fairly unusual. I found the door hanging wide open. Propped up in a chair in the exact spot where you now sit, will lay with a blast hole showing clear through his skull, a shotgun laying at his feet. And next to him, I found a blood-stained diary open to the middle page. The last entry was stained with blood spatter, but still visible. I remember leaning down and reading it. It was only a few sentences long. I glanced over at the bookshelf with the same diary, saying nothing. It said something like, I see now what's going on. The twisted man is leading me to the truth. Today, I will finally find it. And that was his suicide note? I asked, my heart hammering in my chest. He nodded. Yeah. I went into town and got some rangers to come check it out. Eventually, they got cops and CSI there. They took all the stuff as evidence, including the diary, he said. Good riddance, I say. Reading something like that is never beneficial. Sometimes delusions spread like a virus, you know what I mean? I did, but I said nothing. I glanced back at the diary, its black leather cover gleaming like a crouching snake. And I wondered if the police took the diary as evidence, how did it get back here? You said he had a wife living here with him, too? I asked. Yeah, she went missing around the same time, he said. Pretty bizarre. The cops thought maybe she just moved away, but he shook his head grimly. As far as I know, she was never seen again. It was like she had evaporated into thin air. After Steve left, I walked stiffly over to the bookshelf, taking down the diary. I flipped open through the pages. In the middle, I found the last entry. Spatters of old, darkened blood were scattered over the page like raindrops. I found the suicide note and read the date. January 27, 2015, it read. Will Lenning had not lived long after he started seeing the twisted man. I wondered if my fate would be the same. The sun had started to set outside as I sat with the diary at the small circular kitchen table, eating some stewed venison and rice as I read through the entries. At the end, Will Lenning said the twisted man had been trying to guide him somewhere, that, in fact, the twisted man had been trying to protect him from some great evil rather than being the source of it. I scoffed, feeling a flash of anger at his stupidity. His naivety obviously led to his death. But then a flash of insight struck me like lightning. What if I was committing the same kind of stupidity? Perhaps I should just grab my gun and valuables and leave. I could take off on the snowmobile and be in town within a couple hours. But, in my heart, I knew I would not. Something about the mystery of all this beckoned me to stay. Like a siren leading sailors to destruction, my curiosity called out to me, and I knew I would not be leaving that night. I needed answers. And, sadly, I would find them. I had fallen asleep with an empty bottle of beer in my hand. I sat in front of the TV, which only got satellite reception. There were, of course, no cable or phone lines threading their way through the forest. All of my power came from stored solar energy. Since I rarely watched TV and really only used it to cook or heat up water for bathing, the energy produced was sufficient even in winter. Tonight, though, I needed its sound, its mindless flashing of light and colors and kid laughter. It seemed to drive away the creeping, suffocating presence like a candle. I woke suddenly. The TV flashed with static. The repetitive hissing of the white noise spit from the speakers like thousands of snakes. I glanced up at the clock. 3.33 a.m. I looked around the dark cabin, confused for a long moment. I didn't understand what had woken me so abruptly. The satellite had never gone out before either, even with the howling winds and freezing hail of the Alaskan winter. The TV started flickering as if the static were rising upwards. Black lines traced their way horizontally across the screen. The hissing deepened into a gurgle, and for a second, I thought I heard faint words behind the white noise. I thought I heard breathing, slow and diseased, like the death gasp of a drowning man. A black line rose across the TV and an image came into view. The cabin was suddenly plunged into silence, except for the shrieking, wintry wind outside. 
I leaned close to the screen, confused at what I was looking at. It looked like a live camera feed of a room. As I took in the details, I realized it was my cabin. I saw myself in the chair, leaning close to the screen. I raised my hand, and the miniature version of me on the screen did likewise. Ice water seemed to drip down my spine as waves of dread coursed through my body. What the fuck is this? I whispered, looking back to where the camera should be. It was just a coarse wooden ceiling in that corner. I turned back to the screen and nearly screamed. The TV showed a pale, naked man crouching directly behind my chair now. With jerky movements, he rose, his broken spine twisting and shivering. A hissing voice rang out from the speakers. It spoke as if it had dirt and writhing maggots in its throat. He is a killer. The shadow of death, it gurgled. Many have fallen. Many lie buried across this forest. You will be next. He is watching you. Long, broken fingers with blackened nails reached out to touch my shoulders. I jumped out of the chair, stumbling back as I spun around in terror. My back smashed into the TV, and it fell to the floor with a shattering of glass and an explosion of light. In those few moments before the darkness descended on me like a blanket, I thought I glimpsed a pale, sunken face with rotted, blackened eyes peeking out from behind the chair. I turned on every light in the cabin, but there was no sign of the twisted man now. I knew I had to get out of there, though. I thought about the warning that the voice had spoken. If the creature wanted to attack me, then why hadn't it just killed me while I was sleeping? None of it made sense. Who was watching me? The twisted man? And if he was, why warn me? Perhaps it was psychological warfare, I thought to myself. Perhaps the twisted man simply liked to play with his food before he ate it. Thoughts raced through my head at a thousand miles an hour as I threw on snow pants and a couple heavy sweaters and coats. I covered up my entire body as much as I could to try to prevent frostbite. I had made up my mind to flee. There was no snowstorm tonight, though the entire landscape was blanketed in it and I knew the wind chill would be like an ice blade whipping against my skin. It was extremely dangerous to travel in the middle of the night like this in temperatures that might reach negative 30 degrees. Steve had been right, after all Alaska had the highest missing persons rate of any state, and many of them were never found, their bodies likely frozen solid in the deep snow dozens of miles from the nearest town. I grabbed my shotgun, jumped on my snowmobile and started heading to Steve's cabin. I hoped I could wait there until the sunrise and then figure out what to do next. But fate would take the decision out of my hands. I felt like there were eyes watching me as I drove along the narrow, winding deer trail. The boughs of the evergreens reached into the path like greedy hands, grabbing at my coat and legs. More than a couple times, I thought I saw a pale, naked figure standing in the snow, but it had always gone when I turned to look. I gave a sigh of relief when Steve's place appeared in the distance. I could see the lights twinkling through the small windows of his log cabin. I pulled up next to his door, looking down. I saw two pairs of footprints there, one much smaller than the other. I found it odd, but shrugged it off. The snowmobile cut out with a sucking gurgle. I knocked on the door hard a few times. Steve appeared after a few moments, groggy and half-dressed. He blinked slowly as he looked me up and down. His wrinkled face fell into a frown. Steve, I need a favor, I said quickly. Something weird is happening in my cabin. Can I stay here until morning, until maybe I can go to town or something? I can't stay at my place tonight. I just can't. He nodded, yawning and motioning me in. You can sleep on the couch, I guess, Steve said. Put that shotgun somewhere safe, though, boy. He had a partitioned bedroom in his cabin. It was significantly larger than my little one-room cabin, though it was basically still just a joint kitchen living room, a small bedroom and a bathroom. He pointed to a well-worn couch in the corner and gave me an apathetic wave as he stumbled back into his bedroom, slamming the door. I couldn't sleep, though. I tiptoed around the room, looking at Steve's bookshelf. He had a rather strange taste in books lots of him rule and true crime there. I saw dozens of books about Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Richard Chase, Herbert Mullen, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Richard Ramirez among the collection. At the end, a large, 
black binder stood, unlabeled and worn looking. It reminded me of the look of that leather-bound diary for a second, and my heart dropped. But logically, I knew this was just a coincidence. Yet, still, I pulled out the binder, my curiosity peaked. What I found inside filled me with dread and horror. Countless news clippings covered the length of it. The first clipping was from nearly 20 years earlier, about a woman who went missing in the Alaskan forest while hiking. A later one confirmed that her body was never found, and that her family was still hoping that she might turn up alive somewhere. A reward was offered for any information, it said. And every page after that was more of the same, missing woman, murdered prostitute, missing man, no leads. I kept flipping through until I found clippings about Lenning's suicide and the sudden disappearance of his wife. On the article about the suicide, Steve had used red marker to scroll, H-A-H-A, next to it. I heard the click of a gun being cocked from behind me. I froze as Steve's voice traveled across the room like a whisper. How do you like my work, friend? He asked, his tone jovial and mocking. I still held the binder of horrors tightly in my hands as I stared open mouthed at this man I thought I knew. It's you? What, you killed Will Lenny and his wife? And a lot of other women, apparently. Everything felt unreal, as if I were stuck in a dream. Steve's grin spread across his face, but his blue eyes stayed cold and dead. Yes, well, she was cheating on him with me anyway. Just another whore, you know? They always get what's coming to them in the end, he hissed with hatred oozing from his voice. It's too bad, really. I just killed another slut tonight. I was planning on saving you for later. The urge isn't too bad yet right now, after all. It comes in cycles. You see, it comes in waves. I saw a glimmer of pale, naked flesh writhing behind Steve. With jerky movements, the twisted man came up behind him. I said nothing, just watching with wide-eyed horror and amazement. You need help, man, I whispered. Steve laughed. Help? The only help they give people like me is a needle in the arm. You know that. That's why it's important to always cover your tracks, the twisted man ran a long, broken finger across Steve's neck. Steve gave a strangled cry and jumped. He spun around, screaming. I glanced over at my shotgun next to the couch. I jumped for it as Steve turned back to me, firing his pistol twice. The first bullet soared high above me, raining with splinters down on my head, but the second ripped into my leg. A cold, burning pain ran like fire up my shin. I screamed in agony and battle fury as I gripped the shotgun, spinning and firing. Steve's head exploded as the slug ripped through his brain. His forehead collapsed like a smashed melon as bone splinters and blood sprayed the wall behind him. The twisted man stood there, hunched over, grinning up at me. I felt warm blood gushing from my leg as I stared back at him, breathing hard. I wondered if I was dying. You, you weren't after me at all, were you? I asked. You were after. Steve. But the twisted man said nothing. After a long moment, he slinked back into the shadows of the bedroom and disappeared. As night crawled its way toward morning, I thought back to the words the twisted man had spoken through the TV, suddenly understanding everything. He is a killer. The shadow of death. Many have fallen. Many lie buried across this forest. You will be next. He is watching you. He hadn't been trying to hurt me at all. He had been trying to warn me. He had probably tried to warn Lenning and his wife, too. I wrapped my leg in gauze, gritting my teeth. The wound looked puckered and deep, but I could still move my foot, and the bullet had gone clean through the flesh. I poured alcohol on it, screaming in pain as it burned its way through my skin. After rummaging through Steve's bathroom, I found some prescription painkillers and swallowed a handful of them with a beer. I knew I would need the opiate high to get through the pain of riding into town with a mutilated leg. As the sun finally rose, I made my way outside the blood-stained floors of the cabin to my snowmobile. Before I left, I glanced back at that horrid place, the scene of so much torment and death. In the open doorway, the twisted man stood, his back hunched, his rotted lips grinning at me. His hand lifted up into the air with jerky movements and waved. 
I waved back as I started the engine and headed into town.